embers. Um, so uh, we've arranged to, for the bank uh, in the family building to be opened uh, today from, I think, 1 to 2. Um, and so there will be a shuttle bus uh, in the front at 12.50. The people that still need to get reimbursed, uh, you can leave a bit earlier and, and so take the, bu the shuttle bus in front of the building at 12.50. Okay? Okay, so for this uh, uh, lecture, it's, it's a bit more technical. So the idea of this lecture is to, to show you uh, uh, what EPW can do um, and how to use it. And this afternoon, we're going to do a hands-on. But in this uh, lecture, I will really try to go a bit inside the code. I will show you what are the main routine. Um, because EPW is, is, is somewhat a, a post-processing tool. So sometimes it's also useful to really understand the structure of the code and, and, and the different subroutine. And you can actually th then go inside and, and do some modification uh, for the, the, the problem that you're inter interested in. So I think it's, it's very useful to also understand a bit uh, exactly uh, the different subroutines. And this is what I'm going to try to do. Um, so we can, we can try to make it a bit more interactive. So if you have a question, you can definitely uh, stop me during the talk, ask the question, and then uh, rather than at, at the end, so that it's, it's, it's a bit more uh, lively. So, so please do, do ask questions during the talk. Um, so, so it will be relatively brief, so I, so I do expect questions. Um, so I will present a bit the uh, overview of the EPW software and what are the different uh, uh, capability. Uh, and then I will present, as I said, the, the structure, the main structure of the code. And I will fin finally discuss some technicalities on how to do practical calculation and what are the different uh, uh, convergence parameters you need to be uh, uh, careful with. Um, so we've already discussed this a bit, but what is EPW? It's a, a free GPL Fortran open access uh, code, which is part of the uh, quantum distribution, quantum express or distribution uh, now, and it relies on the uh, a maximally localized uh, one-year function framework that we saw uh, yesterday. Uh, and specifically, it uses a, uh, the one-year 90 uh, code through a libraries. So when you run EPW, it will actually call some of the one-year 90 uh, uh, routine. So the main idea uh, is basically to take some quantity uh, in block space that are on a relatively coarse uh, k-point grid and q-point grid like we saw uh, yesterday, and then to use uh, maximally localized one-year transformation to go from this uh, coarse Q space onto a localized uh, uh, real space. So the goal is to be as localized as possible because then we can do uh, the um, maximally localized one-year function back and we can do an interpolation. So it will be a, a Fourier interpolation uh, onto a much denser uh, Q and um, a K point and Q point mesh. Uh, while uh, getting some, some physics into it. So yesterday what we've done, if we, we've done a double grid technique, so we've done a linear interpolation of the electron phonon matrix element, but now we want to do something slightly more fancy and we want to do a, 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 an interpolation based on, on one year function. So what are the properties that EPW can, can, can give you? So it can give you um, interpolated electron phonon matrix elements, so those, those G, on very, very dense uh, uh, k-point and q-point grids. Um, it can allow you to compute uh, uh, line width, so both the electron and the phonon line width. So when you compute uh, uh, the self-energy, so either the electron self-energy or the phonon self-energy, if you compute the imaginary part, so this is the line width or the scattering rate. So the line width and the scattering rate they are uh, very similar, it's just one over the other, uh, and the lifetime. You can also compute uh, electron and phonon uh, uh, spectral function. You can compute um, coupling strength. So this is the lambda that we've been uh, computing uh, yesterday. Uh, it's also possible to use EPW to compute uh, superconducting property, only the phonon limited superconducting properties. And this will be done on Friday uh, by uh, Roxana. And, and finally, you can also use EPW to do transport property. So you can do, yes? So, so in this framework, it's used for, for metals. So the, only for metals, yes. The, the, the code will be giving you the, the lambda only for metals. So the equation, um, I don't know if I will show the equation, but yesterday you had the equation. And you will see that in the equation you have a delta 
uh, uh, close to the Fermi surface. So you need to have a Fermi surface, so you need a, a metal in this case. To get this specific quantity as it is defined, no. Because it's specifically defined for the family level. Um, so, and then yeah, you can also compute a, a transport property. So we will see mobility in semiconductor and we will see resistivity in the case of metals. Um, so some of the features of, of EPW, uh, it supports only two functionals, LDA and GDA. You can use uh, K-point and Q-point parallelization, and to some extent, you can also use band parallelization, but this is some, only on some part of the code, so <coughs> the recommended procedure is just to parallelize on, on K-point and Q-point. Um, it supports spin-orbit coupling, time reversal symmetry. Um, this will be uh, discussed at the end, so it also correctly interpolates the polar divergence. Um, it relies, and it's integrated into quantum expressor, relies on one in IT. It's parallelized using uh, MPI, and has a test farm to, to make sure that the code is uh, stable and also compiles on different uh, uh, compilers uh, and with different libraries. And um, it has also documentation and a lot of takes. So just to show, so there has been some, some effort to try to speed up the code. So this was an earlier version of the code, and you can see that um, a lot of effort that has been dedicated to, to speed up the code. So this is with one CPU, just try to, to get the, the code faster. So in, the, in red, you have the uh, version four of EPW, and you can see, so in red, that you have a, quite a big reduction of time, so this is the total time for the different parts of the code, and this is the total time for a specific run. Um, we've also worked on the uh, MPI parallelization. So this is uh, what's it, gallium nitride uh, example. So you can see that the speed up is, is relatively decent until uh, 1,000 or 2,000 core. This is done on the UK uh, National uh, Archer supercomputer. Uh, and recently, uh, I've done also some tests on this new family of, of, of uh, HPC, which are the Xeon 5. So those are the new type of architecture with a lot of CPU and not that much memory. And you can see that it also quite decently scale up to uh, 8,000 core. And this was done in Cambridge, one of the new uh, um, cluster that they have there. So this, just to show basically uh, what I mean by, by test farm, so there's uh, a software called BuildBot, which allows you to, to integrate all of that. So what you do is basically every time you have uh, you commit uh, to the repository, so we, we have a GitLab repository, every time there is a commit, then the uh, BuildBot test farm will detect that there is a commit, and during the night, it will trigger a series of tests and the test will be run on different uh, compiler, different machine, uh, to make sure that the, the code works on all of those different configurations. And so you can see that some of them fail, some of them work, and this is like the, the framework in real time. So if you go on the website, uh, you, can, you can actually see the build bot uh, in action. So on the EPW website, you have something called, called the test farm. You can click and you will see uh, uh, this kind of, of, of stuff. So you can see basically when the build starts and the test that is made. So basically it's trying to compile and then it tries to run a number of tests and it verifies that the sum of the physical quantity are correct up to a certain accuracy. Um, however, we still have some limitation. Um, we can only deal with non-conserving. So in principle, we want to also add uh, ultrasoft, so that should not be too difficult, uh, but it's not done yet. Uh, we cannot deal with magnetization. Um, at the moment, we have no G-vector parallelization, so we only use uh, K-point parallelization. And uh, in terms of exchange correlation functional, we only have the LDA and GGA. So if you want to do a more fancy one, this is also not available at the moment. And we don't have uh, a DFT plus U, uh, but this is also not implemented in, in the phone code. So um, obviously not in the public version. Um, okay, so when you download Quantum Expressor, you will have a folder called uh, EPW. And so if you look at in the folder, you will have those different uh, things. So you have a binary folder, which contains obviously the binary when you compile the code. Uh, it also contains a Python script that will be used to gather the results from the phonon code on, uh, and to put them in a format that is suitable for EPW. EPW.md is for markdown. This is only used um, in uh, things like GitLab, GitLab or GitHub to show some information in a nice format. So this is just some global information. You have a example folder, and oh, maybe I should show, it. yeah. You have an example folder um, that contains all the examples that are needed for the tutorials that you can find on the website. So 
some of the example there can be quite time consuming because we try to give somewhat reasonable values. So when you run those examples, it, it can be quite long. Um, we also have, there's also a test suite with it, which I will show uh, here. So quantum express or slash test suite, and then we have all the tests related with EBW. And so this test suite is basically what is used by Billbot. And all of those tests here, those you can run very fast. So if you want to check that, the I mean, it's correctly compiled, you can uh, go in test suite and simply do make test. This will test all the tests, including EPW, but you can also look at the input if you want to try to have a feel on, on how those things work. And if they are also guarantees to work in the sense that this is tested by Billboard, so you're sure that this works. Um, however, you have a folder called test, which used to contain the test and it's still there for some historical reason. It's not even guaranteed that all the tests here works because this is not tested by Billboard. So some of them you might have to change the input because the input might have changed and things like that. So I would recommend not to use things that are in test. Uh, eventually this folder will be deleted. Uh, then you have Ford. So Ford is, is a automatic documentation for Fortran. And so if you, so this is basically used to, to if you go on the website, you, you will see, I can, I can maybe quickly show. So, um, so this is the EPW uh, uh, website. And if you want, to see what kind of things. So this is automatic. I mean, if you have any code, uh, this will be automatically uh, created by Ford. So it, it shows you a lot of uh, interesting stuff like um, the link, you know, so this is the link, everything. So, okay, so epw.f90 is the main Fortran file, and it will show you all the modules that are called by epw. And then if you click on, on one of them, uh, you, can, you can follow, so they are used by all of those routines, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, let's say, graphical way to navigate through the uh, code. Um, okay. Mm. Right. Um, yeah, then you have the readme with some uh, extra information and the make file, which allows you to do simply make uh, and to compile the code and analyze them. So this is more or less uh, all of it. So the most important part, obviously, is the source. So we're gonna go in through that. So the, the first, let's say, main file is the epw.f90 file, and it contains uh, a lot of stuff, but mainly a call to, to those routines. So we will go a bit through them. So first, you have a routine that allows you to read the input file, simply. Um, then you allocate all the um, large array that you will need for the uh, epw calculation. You have a setup of some of the uh, quantity. And then the first interesting call is this call to one-year run. So this is a call to the one-year library. And um, when you do this uh, call, so you have a, a um, input variable in EPW, which is called one year -ize. If you put this to true, it will one year uh, using one year 90. And if you put it to false, it will assume that you've already done the one-year calculation and it will restart after this call. So once you've completed this call, it will write some uh, input uh, actually should be written, okay? So inside this oneerise.f90 Fortran file, you have different calls. And so those calls are called to the PW2 one year uh, 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 libraries. And so at the end of all of those steps, so again, this is all automatic. So it will basically compute the AMN matrices that we saw yesterday. It will compute the MNN. So this is the overlap matrix element that uh, we've been discussing yesterday. So all of it will be automatically, will be printed on file. And so you will have uh, an automatic generation of those uh, files. So EPW will generate basically a uh, one year uh, friendly, uh, let's say input file. And so one year will then read this one. You will have an output. So while EPW is running, you can also look at this file, prefix.wout, which is uh, uh, a direct output from, from the one year code. So if you understand how one year runs, then you will understand this, this, this file. So if you have an issue during the one yearization, you can always look it's always good to look in this output because it will tell you uh, what went, I mean, can help you to figure out what went wrong. At the end, you also have an NNKP file, uh, which if you remember, it's um, very important because it contains all the nearest neighbor that are used to compute the uh, MNM uh, KB matrices. So B is the, 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 the next neighbor uh, along this line. Um, and finally, you have the UKK, so this is the uh, rotation matrix to go from block space to, um, to real space and vice versa, uh, where the phase has been set to maximally localize your uh, function as we, as we saw yesterday. And so at the end of all these steps, uh, because those files are written to file, you can restart 
uh, as I said, using the one erase fault, and so you don't have to redo the calculation uh, when you pass that point. Um, next, we have the call to the main routine, which is Elphon shuffle wrap, so it's a wrapper to the electron phonon shuffle routine. And again, at the end of this call, you can also restart the calculation using those parameter. Um, so you can, yeah, you can basically, so this tells the code to write the EPB file uh, and then to read it. So if you want to restart from there. So I will go a bit more in detail in, in this routine. So first you compute uh, P and M, which are the dipole matrix elements. Uh, and those matrix elements are used to compute the velocity. Uh, and so at, at the end of, of the beginning of this routine, you will get files. So I'm trying also to show what are the kind of files that are uh, produced by EPW so that you understand. So, so EPW produce quite a lot of files and it's, it's important to understand what those files contain. So there, is, there will be a K map and a K G map files. So it's stored the index of K plus Q on the course grid, which will be useful to unfold the matrix element. So when we do the calculation uh, using the phonon code, we do it on an irreducible Brewer zone. So the idea is you don't want to compute on all the, the Q points, so you want to take advantage of the symmetry. So you use normally the phonon code and you will get the electron phonon matrix element on the irreducible wedge. Um, however, for the EPW code, we need the electron phonon matrix element on the full Brewer zone in order to do um, the uh, one year uh, transformation. So the first thing that the EPW code does is to unfold uh, from the irreducible Brewer wedge to the full Brewer wedge using uh, uh, symmetries. And so we need to map uh, all the K and K plus Q. Uh, and the KG map is basically the G vector that are required to map K plus Q, the K plus Q grid onto the original uh, K point, coarse K point gate. Um, so this, this will be done in, in those create K map uh, routine. Then you want to find the crystal symmetry because as I said, we will use the crystal symmetry um, at a specific Q point. So when you, you have the crystal symmetry uh, let's say, say of the crystal, so maximum number of symmetry. So in silicon, you will have, uh, let's say, 40, uh, 48 uh, symmetry. Um, but then if you start displacing the atom, you will break some of the symmetry. So in certain Q direction, you will have lower number of symmetry, but you will still have some symmetry. And so this routine find what is called the star of Q. So this is all the symmetry for a given Q that you uh, retain. So this will allow you to expand the, the G from the irreducible Brewer zone to the full one. And then you have the call to this elf phone shuffle, which is exactly the routine that does what I've described. So you, you want to unfold. So you want to construct the electron phone matrix element. And then the rotate uh, EP mat is the one that rotates the electron phone matrix element from the irreducible Brewer zone to all the symmetry equivalent points. So uh, this is in equation uh, what it is. So basically the electron phone matrix element We've, we've seen it uh, in the talk before, like in a compact form, where you had the uh, sandwich between the wave function at k plus q and the wave function at k, and we had the change of the uh, self-consistent potential. So this is the equation that we saw, but you can actually expand that into an electric, uh, electronic contribution and, uh, and, and an ionic contribution. And the reason to, to do that is because when you do the unfolding using symmetries, you need to treat that a bit differently. So here you just do an expansion, but it's, it's basically the same thing as here. You do an expansion um, by, by using those um, um, yeah, sandwich. Um, and so how to get a symmetry related Q point is to apply uh, a certain symmetry operation. So this is the star of Q. So this is the, the set of symmetry for that particular Q point that allows you to go from the irreducible wedge to the full wedge. And so if you want to know, so let's say you know what is the value of the electron phonon matrix element at a specific Q in the reducible Brewer zone. Now you want to know what is the value of that G, but at a rotated symmetry related uh, point. And so you can apply uh, uh, basically those, those rotation and you get the symmetry related one. And then, as I said, we also support time reversal symmetry so that you don't have to compute it explicitly. So basically it's just the minus one and then fits a very similar um, let's say set of um, symmetry application on all of these. Okay, so this allows us to unfold. Uh, we are still in the coarse uh, uh, K point and Q point gate, but we go from the irreducible wedge to the full wedge. And this uh, is basically the main file, and those files are quite big. So this is the EPB file, 
And those contain the matrix element on the full uh, core of the one zone. And you will have one of them per CPU on which you parallelize. Okay, so um, those files are, are quite good. And, and then if you want to restart using the option that I show, so once you've done that unfolding, you can restart from the EPB. So you have something called EPB write. So when you want to first create them, you need to put write to, to true, of course. And then when you already have them, you put that to false and this one to true. And this will allow you to restart directly from this unfolded uh, um, electron standard matrix element. Okay? So once we are in the fully unfolded one, what we want to do is we want to do a tr um, maximally localized uh, uh, Fourier transform. So at the end of this uh, routine, we have a call to EPH1 to shuffle. So this is really the main uh, routine of EPW, and this routine uh, allows you to go from the coarse grid onto the real space, and then uh, back you can do the uh, back interpolation uh, in that routine. And so once you've finished that routine, those are the restart options. So once you've um, that once you went from the uh, irreducible, sorry, once you went from the coarse grid onto the real space, then you have uh, I will show the files that are produced, and then you can restart from there and do the final interpolation how many times you want. And these are the restart options. And so typically, once you've written to file the EPHWP, which I will sh show after, then you can you can basically remove. I mean, I would, I would advise to remove those files because they are useless at that point, and then those are quite big, so you, you, you don't need them anymore. So I will go through this. So this is the, the, the main routine of, of EPW. So the first thing you do in that routine is to load the uh, U matrices that you've computed during the one-erized uh, process. So if you remember, you had this .ukk file, and so you, you first load those uh, rotation matrix elements. Then you have something called Hamiltonian block to one year. So this uh, transform the Hamiltonian from the block uh, space on the coarse grid onto uh, real space, uh, so one year space is basically real space. And then you do the same for the matrix element, you do the same for the dynamical matrix, and this is the two main routines. You go from, uh, so, so this is to convert the electron standard matrix element from block state to one year space, but you do it in two steps. And this is why we have uh, two routines. And so at the end of that, when, when this is all done, then you have the matrix element uh, in uh, real space. So at the end of this one, and I will, I will show that this is done in two steps, at the end of this one, you get this file, epmatwe, okay? And then this is an intermediate step file. And uh, the reason we create that is because it's a very big file, and we, we need basically to read it because we cannot store everything on memory. And then at the end of this step, you get this epmatwp. And this is really the only file that you want to keep. So this is the electron phone matrix element in one year space, in real space. And then once you have this one, you can do any interpolation that you want. So you can always restart from there, and then you can compute, you can converge the mobility, you can have very dense k-point grid, q-point grid, um, and you can do everything you want. But the point is that you can also remove this file. It's not needed. So this is the only file that you really need to keep along with those files. So you, you will see that you have a, a set of uh, FMT files. FMT stands for formatted files. So if you open them, those are text files, whereas those are a binary files. So the first one contains um, crystal information. So it's things like uh, lattice parameter, uh, things like that. Um, the second file contains uh, the dipole. And this is uh, used for the velocity. Uh, and finally, the EPW dat file contains, um, so the, the Z star and dielectric function, this is used in the case of polar materials. And it also contains the uh, real space uh, Hamiltonian plus dynamical matrix. So this is what is, uh, that what, you, what you get from those two uh, initial steps. Um, so if you have an issue, if you get, for example, uh, zero result or none or things like that, usually it's a very good idea to go and look at those uh, three files. But something that is uh, quite typical is, is, for example, this file is not being produced correctly for some reason. It could contain, for example, all zero. And so if all the velocity are zero, obviously your uh, mobility will be zero. And so this is a very strong hint uh, where the issue could be. So it's important to, to, to sort of look at those files. Okay, so now I will, I will explain a bit the, the math behind the, the different routines. So this first routine, ham block to one, what it does is it takes the Hamiltonian in block space on the coarse grid, so H, M prime, N prime, K, and it uses this uh, rotation matrix element that we've computed from uh, uh, one year to get the maximally localized uh, one year function. So this is an object that has N, N prime, 
k uh, dimension, and, and you rotate that with this uh, a phase factor because it's basically a Fourier transform, uh, and you get this Hamiltonian in, um, um, let's say, real space point. So it's important to notice that here you have only one index, so it's a difference of two index, so it means you only have one, uh, let's say, um, distance uh, coordinate. Uh, and then you can do the same for the dynamical matrix. You have the, the, the um, dynamical matrix that you get from uh, the DFPT code. Um, so this is the uh, Fourier transform of the uh, interatomic force constant. And you can uh, use the eigen displacement vector, and then you can do a, a Fourier transform. So you see that the, this part does not use uh, the one year code. So this is really a Fourier interpolation. So this is the same kind of Fourier interpolation that you do when you want to do a full advanced factor. It's exactly the same thing. So here we don't use maximally localized uh, one-year function for the phonon part, that phonon part. So N and NP are simply uh, um, Bond von Karman uh, supercell, so just to normalize uh, everything correctly. Um, and so when those, once those two routines have been called, you will have uh, those two files. So those are called DK files. The first one is the DK of the Hamiltonian, and the second one is the DK of the dynamical matrix. And so those are files that you really need to check because if the winerization was done properly, you should have a very localized Hamiltonian, very localized dynamical matrix. And so they should DK as a function of this, the difference between the, the two uh, positions, they should DK quite fast. So you can see in a logarithmic scale, they DK quite nicely to 10 to the minus five or something like that. So if when you do the calculation, you see that it doesn't decay very well, it stays to 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two, then it means you might have an issue with your one-yearization. So you need to go back and maybe look at, at, at the one-year uh, code. Um, yes, so the first one was the Hamiltonian, and this is basically exactly the same, but for the uh, dynamical matrix. So both of them need to decay uh, uh, quite well. Okay, so now the most uh, difficult one is to transform the electron phonon matrix element. So we want to go from this electron phonon matrix element that is a five-dimensional object, so uh, band, band, mode, and then uh, k-point, q-point uh, on the coarse grid. And again, this is what is stored in the epb.x uh, file. So x is for uh, all the CPU because this is um, written per CPU, whereas the ephwp, you only have one big file. And this is then MPI read uh, when you restart. So just a technical point, when you restart from the EPB, because you have one per CPU, you have to use the same number of CPU that you use to create those EPB. You cannot change the number of CPU. Whereas at the end of the EPHW, when you have it in real space, because it's only one file, you can restart with any number of CPUs. This is a bit more flexibility when you, you want to restart. Um, okay, so basically, the electron phonon matrix element is a combination of electronic and phonon uh, kind of property, and this is the reason why we need to do uh, sort of a double transform. So we need to do a transformation on the electronic state, so this is this first part, and then we also need to do a transformation on the uh, phonon uh, state. And, this is, and for that reason, we, we're gonna do this in two steps. So this is the full uh, equation for the full transformation, but in practice, we're gonna do that in two steps. So first step is, is electron phonon uh, block to one year E for electronics. So we first transform the electronic part, so we go from the G and we use the rotation matrix element in the same way as we do it for the Hamiltonian. And this will give us a G that still has this uh, Q uh, phonon component, but now has the uh, electronic component in real space. And then this is printed to file in the EPWE uh, uh, file that I, that I told you. And, um, and then we read this in the code, and it's, it's now here. And now we call this second routine EPH block to one P for phonon, and then we do the second transformation. So we now uh, use this, this Fourier, uh, basically, uh, transformation uh, with the phonon frequency and the mass of the atom uh, kappa, and we get this object, which has now uh, N, M, and then kappa, and this is uh, alpha is the Cartesian direction, um, and then we have those two uh, real space uh, in, uh, indices. So in this case, you see we have two real space indices, one corresponding to the uh, electron if you want, and one corresponding to, to the phonon. And so at the end of uh, that second routine, uh, well, actually at, at the end of the first routine, you get a decay file for the electronic part, and at the end of the second one, you get a decay file for both of them. So actually, you can first look at that file. If that file converges well, then you're happy, you don't need to look at the other one. In case this doesn't converge very well, then you can uh, 
try to look maybe in the electronic one so that you can see uh, where the problem comes from. So for example, if this one uh, decays very well, but this one doesn't, then maybe the issue is related with the phonon. So <laughs> this might also give you some, some information. Mm -hmm. So in, in this plot, I'm showing uh, the decay, uh, but uh, for the electron and for the phonon. So this is basically this object and then, and then that object. And again, you should expect a logarithmic decay. So when you, you plot with new plot, you can uh, use a logarithmic plot to see a nice uh, uh, decay, and you, you should get such, such decay. Okay, so um, so we've done we've done all of that. Uh, sorry, yeah. So at that point, we have everything in uh, uh, real space, and so the transformation is done. The big file is written to file, and now we want to do the interpolation because that's the main aim of, of EPW. So we want to interpolate on a very very dense uh, uh, grid, and so what we're going to do is simply the reverse process. So it's a uh, one-year interpolation. So now you have the same routine, and I won't show them again, but basically it's exactly the same equation, but reversed. So now we do dynamical one year to block. So we go from real space to block space for the dynamical matrix. Then you do the same, but for the, uh, basically the electron phonon matrix element, uh, but we do it in reverse. So we first do the transformation on the, on the phonon, and then we will do on the electron. So L phon one year to block P, okay? Uh, then we do the Hamiltonian, we do the dipole, and finally, we do the final step, which is uh, going from the uh, one year, uh, um, I mean, the electron in one year space and the phonon in block space, because we already done the phonon here, to the final electron in block space and phonon in block space, which is the interpolated uh, electron phonon matrix element. And so once we have that, then we have a, a plethora of, of, of a routine that computes different uh, uh, physical quantity. And so depending on the input variable that you've set, so for example, let's say if you want to compute the phonon self energy, then you, you put uh, phon self true in the input, and this will call, uh, for example, this routine. So this is, you have a, not, a big outer loop on, on Q point, and you have a parallelization on, on K point in this case. Um, and so for each Q point, you will go inside, inside this routine, and it will use the interpolated matrix element, and it will compute the property that you ask. So the first one is to print the electron phonon matrix element. So a lot of people are interested in, in looking at what the G look like, so you can do print GKK through, and then it will go inside this routine. Phonon self energy, electron self energy, um, you can have uh, also plasmon, nesting function, uh, electronic spectral function, phonon spectral function, uh, plasmon spectral function, and then the, the last two are related with uh, transport properties, so they are related with scattering rate that you will use to, to compute the mobility. So you compute the, the tau, if you remember the tau uh, uh, zero that I showed in the previous talk. This is computed in scattering rate underscore Q, and then transport coefficient is doing the summation of all the K points to get the, the, the mobility. Okay, so uh, this is basically what I've said. So for example, uh, this routine, uh, one of the important ones, so the electron self-energy uh, is basically this object. So this is the fan migdal uh, electron self-energy that you've uh, seen in the first lecture this morning. Uh, it's, it's simply the electron from matrix element. So now we have this object interpolated on a very dense grid at a relatively uh, affordable cost. And then we just multiply this object with those, uh, those parameters. So we, we know all of them. So okay, something to mention. In this case, the F are actually the F0 from my previous talk. So this is the, those F are really the uh, um, Fermi-Dirac distribution function. It's not the out of equilibrium that we saw uh, for the mobility. So this is really Fermi-Dirac. This is Bose-Einstein distribution function. So it would be zero at the, uh, uh, zero Kelvin, and then we'll, it, will, it will increase. Uh, then you have uh, phonon frequency, uh, and then of course the spectral function depends on, on omega, so you have this, and, and then you have a small broadening uh, parameter, which this is here, and should you should converge to zero. Uh, so yeah, this is what was presented uh, this morning. Uh, and now I'm showing the equation for the, uh, the other one, which is the phonon self-energy. So it's a relatively similar object. Um, and this will actually be presented in, in more detail, I think, I think tomorrow. Um, right, so, so this is some of the input variables that are needed to print physical quantity, like the phonon self-energy and things like that. So if you want to have the electron self-energy, you put L self and true. To get the uh, nesting function, you put that to true. Phonon self-energy, you put that to true. Alpha square F is what we've done yesterday. Um, this uh, also triggers the transport alpha square F that is used for the calculation of the resistivity and things like that. 
Um, this is a phonon related properties. So if you want alpha square f, you also need the phonon self energy. They are, they are sort of coupled. So you need the phonon self energy in order to compute alpha square f. Um, electronic spectral function, if you, if you want to plot the spectral function, then you need to specify the frequency range on which you want to have the spectral function. So spectral function was the A uh, omega that we saw this morning. Um, and it depends on the uh, imaginary part and the real part of the electron phonon self energy. Then all of those uh, variables here, so scattering, uh, SRT, et cetera, this is uh, related with the mobility. So this is, you want to compute the scattering rate, and this is the approximation that you want to do. So in this case, you want to do self-energy relaxation time approximation. In principle, there, are all, there could be also other type of approximation, but at the moment, this is the only one that is coded. Uh, and then here, it's if you want to uh, have intrinsic mobility, so this is when you don't put, uh, uh, when you don't put carrier, and okay, so for, for some reason, you can actually um, put the Fermi level, um, you can do n doped or p doped, but if you put both to true, this will automatically compute both the p-dope and the n-dope uh, uh, mobility. So this is the recommended way to compute uh, um, mobility. And then you put the number of carriers that you want. So if you want, you can change this. So this is a typical value, 10 to the 13. But uh, as we saw, uh, the mobility is independent on the uh, carrier concentration for, uh, I mean, within those theories. So in principle, your result should not, almost not change depending on the carrier. You just cannot put a carrier concentration which is too low. If you put a carrier concentration which is far too big, the problem is the code will, at some point, put the family level um, very low, and you might end up, depending on the size of your band gap, so if you have a band gap like this, if you ask for a very high uh, carrier concentration, then the code will try to put it very low, let's say if you want to have an electron, and at some point, if you put the family level here, you will have an issue. So you always want your family level to be within the band gap. So if, if you are here, then you will have depending on, on the temperature also that you want, it will position the, the, the Fermi level. And when you will run the code, you will see that the code will tell you which Fermi level has been detected. And if the code has problems finding the Fermi level, for example, because it goes in the conduction or things like that, it will put a warning. So you need to read the warning saying that it couldn't converge the position of the Fermi level. So the main message is basically choose a value which is more or less reasonable, and within that reasonable range, it should not depend on the character concentration. Uh, and then you can um, so, um, you can ask for different temperature at which you want to compute the uh, uh, mobility. So you put the minimum, maximum, and number of uh, interval steps that you want. Uh, again, you need to be a bit careful. So at zero Kelvin, you, ha you have an issue because the mobility will go to extremely large value. It, it will diverge. So usually, you don't want to put zero Kelvin. You want to put something like 20 Kelvin or 50 Kelvin minimum. Uh, because at low temperature, you will have other mechanisms that will play. So if, for example, you will get uh, ballistic scattering, I mean, ballistic transport and things like that. Um, just one point to notice is you, you will see that there is also another variable that is used in EPW, but not uh, in the case of, of mobility, which is uh, temp. So you have, uh, it's not written here, but you have another variable called temp. And actually, when you do mobility, those temperatures will overseed the other one. So you, you just need to specify those. Okay, and so depending on what you put for the input variables, you will get some files that are created. So the output, um, so, so the idea is not to put too many data in the output file, and instead to create those uh, files. So the line with dot uh, phone on self energy uh, compute, I mean, contains obviously the uh, the phone on self energy. Try to, to yes, and this one is the electron self energy. So it's just a mistake. This would be imaginary part of the uh, phone on self energy anyway. Um, lambda contains the lambda uh, dot phonon self energy because this is a phonon uh, properties. Um, and then, yeah, uh, so if you do spectral function, you will have the value of the A and K of omega. Um, and this supplementary file, actually, or supporting file, contains information that might be used uh, of use if you want to plot it. So, for example, this uh, supporting file also contains uh, uh, eigen energies the value of eigen energies and things like that if you want to, to know at which eigen energy the spectral function is plotted. And then we have the basically similar uh, spectral function, but for the uh, phone. Okay, so this is just some uh, specific uh, um, technicalities. So 
In the case of uh, polar materials, what happens is you, you create for the um, um, optical mode, you create a, a dipole, and this will have the uh, effect of having the electron phonon matrix element that will diverge as one of a few as you approach uh, gamma. So this is a, a physical behavior. You have a, a divergence, and this can actually be integrated uh, in a, a 3D material. Um, however, the one-year interpolation will not work. Uh, it will wrongly interpolate to zero. And so you need to, to do a correction. And, and this is really in the same spirit as interpolating uh, the dynamical matrix and, and, and having uh, a phonon, I mean, getting a, a phonon band structure and the LOT of splitting in, in the phonon. So the idea is basically to split the electron phonon matrix element in a short range contribution, so gamma S, uh, which is, inter I mean, this, this short range contribution is uh, interpolated using uh, the one year code, and then you have an analytical long range uh, part, which is for very small Q. So in the case of very small Q, so what you, what you basically do is you subtract this long range contribution, then you do the one year interpolation, and then you add it back. And so this analytical uh, part is, is based on, on, on the Frelick model. And so this is fully, uh, let's say, analytical. You have everything. So you have the bond effective charge uh, tensor, and then you have the dielectric uh, 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 function. Um, and so this can be computed analytically, and you add this uh, at the end of the calculation. And so this is to show uh, uh, what you obtain. So the dots are explicit DFPT calculation. And so this is what we've done yesterday using the uh, quantum expressor code. So if you remember, in the case of, of uh, silicon, uh, silicon, I think, well, uh, silicon carbide, yeah, we've uh, computed along the gamma x direction, we've computed seven points by doing seven explicit DFPT phonon calculation, and you've obtained uh, a few points, and, and the way you, you, you should have seen that for the uh, four, four, six, six being the, in that case, the uh, longitudinal, longitudinal optical uh, mode, you should have some sort of divergence, uh, if you remember. At gamma, it's treated differently, so it should, should not be infinite, it's, it's a finite value. Now, if you use uh, pure uh, one-year interpolation on the full matrix element, what one year will do is it will try to go to zero. And so you will have, uh, it will describe correctly, let's say, this part, but then the part close to, to gamma will be treated incorrectly. Uh, however, if you subtract the long range part and then add it back, then you get the blue part and you, you see that it's matched very well. So this afternoon, we will do the hands on and we will use EPW uh, using this uh, L polar correction in order to get the correct, uh, let's say, divergence uh, behavior. So the way to do this is, oh, sorry. No. Yeah, the, the, the way to do that is to set this uh, uh, variable L polar to true, and this will trigger uh, this analytical behavior. So, so most materials are polar, so in most cases, you will need to put L polar true. So the, the few exceptions, yes? Excuse me, uh, that's the Excuse me, yeah. So, uh, Well, it, it, it doesn't have to be zero. It can be finite, but but it's basically it's small compared to the other one. So you you diverge, and then you have uh, so, so it's normal to get something different uh, because it's treated differently. So the, the code doesn't know which branch you're approaching gamma. So um, the the value at gamma depends on the way you approach gamma. So the direction at which you approach gamma. So the code just choose one of them, and then that's what you see. So in principle, you should have seen this if you if you plot the mode six. Uh, you should have seen this diverge. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so, right. Okay, for our diversions. Um, now, another uh, relatively uh, uh, important thing is, is the crystal sum rule. So, in very simple materials like silicon and things like that, you, you can impose the, what is called the simple sum rule, and this is, this is the same sum rule as you can use if you use DINMAT or, or things like that in, in quantum expressor. And this is simply to make sure that the uh, phonon frequency at gamma for the acoustic mode are, are, are zero. Um, however, in, in a lot of more complicated materials or 2D materials or things like that, um, this simple sum rule doesn't work very well, and you have a, 
some, something called the crystal acoustic sound rule. This has been uh, developed by uh, Mingo and, and Nicola Mune in his, in his thesis and implemented in, in, into Quantum Espresso and, and Matt Dean. And, and this um, crystal acoustic sound rule works in general much better than the simple sound rule in those slightly more complicated materials. So if you, if you don't manage to get very good phonons, it's a good idea to try to uh, impose the crystal sound rule. So um, the way to do it is slightly different. So you need to put uh, L interatomic force constant to true, but you need to first generate those atomic force constants. So the way to do that is to use the Q2R um, uh, utility that, that you already need to use when you want to compute, uh, let's say, phonon band structure. And so you, you transform the dynamical matrix into the interatomic force constant using this Q2R. Uh, and, and then basically you place this uh, uh, force constant file into the safe folder of EPW. But you don't need to do this manually. You have this uh, Python script that I told you about. So this Python script is within the um, dot bin, uh, dash bin of EPW. And if you just run the Python script, it will copy automatically this uh, um, interatomic force constant and it will rename it in, in, a, in a format that is, is good for EPW. So the only thing I'm, I'm saying is, if you want to use the crystal sum rule, you need to do an extra step before doing the EPW calculation. You need to use the Q2R to convert into, um, into real space. So this is the, and then the way to do it is basically to say ISF type equal crystal. So by default, the ISF type is simple, um, but if you want to have crystal, then you need to, to run the Q2R. And, and we will do that this afternoon. Uh, I don't always do that. Uh, so this is almost the, the end of the talk. Um, so I'm just gonna specify a few input variables that you need to be specifically careful with. So the f stick windows, so what is uh, what, what that is, is basically a lot of properties. It depends on the properties you want to look at, but a lot of properties, uh, like the mobility, for example, depends on what happened very close to the band edge. So you might be interested in only looking, for example, at an uh, energy window around the Fermi level that is, for example, 1 EV or something like that. Because you know that uh, basically the matrix element from higher up or lower down will not contribute much. And so this is simply a way to speed up the calculation. So if you don't know exactly uh, the property, if you think it might depend on a lot of bands, then you can always put this F stick to a very large value and it will include all the states that you have in, in the calculation. But if you want to speed up the calculation, you might want to reduce this F stick a bit. So the way to, to make sure that this is, this is accurate is basically to, if you, if you put one EV, maybe you want to put 1.5 EV and the property should not change. If it changes, then you need to increase so it's a sort of convergence parameter if you want. You, you increase it until it doesn't change anymore. Uh, but typically, if you put one EV or two EV for most properties, it, it, should, be, it should be fine. Uh, so this is just an extra way to speed up the calculation. But if you don't know what to do, you just put a very large value. Now, this is, this is what I was saying. So EP temp is the temperature at which you do most uh, calculation, like uh, phonon self-energy and things like that. And so, um, in the specific case of the mobility calculation, you specify the temperature in a slightly different way. And so you still have to put a value for this, so there will be a value by default, but this will not be used in the specific case of the mobility calculation. So this is the only thing, is, is this parameter um, will not have an impact. Yes? Right. Um, yes. Yes, I think I, it, it, for the phonon property, I, I will show you maybe in the code um, later on. Um, it's, it's easier if I show you exactly where it goes. But in, indeed, in, the, in all the delta function that you see for the um, F and the sort of the, uh, spectral, fun uh, the spectral function, but also the electron phonon self energy and things like that, uh, indeed, it's this D goes W, which is the broadening. Of, of the function. But if you remember, there's this n parameter. Well, maybe I can show you. Sorry. Uh, right. So you see here, you have a Bose-Einstein distribution. And so the, this is the temperature of the Bose-Einstein distribution. And then um, in those uh, uh, function, you then have the Dirac delta. So um, if you look at the imaginary part of this, this will be a delta function. And so the delta function 
is, um, so the, the width of the delta function is given by these zeros, but the value of the Bose-Einstein distribution is given by this uh, item. Uh, so the, this, uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, correct. So, so indeed, uh, you, you always div uh, divide by this omega, and uh, if you have acoustic phonon, at some point they will, they will go to zero. So you will divide by something very, very small, um, and so numerically this can be uh, indeed problematic. And so uh, there is an input variable which I didn't see, uh, didn't show here, but basically I think it's by default is two or five centimeters minus one. So if the phonon frequency is lower than ten to the minus five, then those electron phonon matrix elements are discarded. So. It, you can, what you can do is basically lower this value and see if, if it affects the result. Um, in, princi in principle, it shouldn't. So also in, in most properties, those do not have a strong contribution anyway. But you, you can always try to do a convergence. You can just uh, decrease this default parameter and see if it changes. But in practice, it shouldn't have a very big impact. So this is something you can converge. Uh, so yeah, that has a default value. It's just for numerical reason to not get one over a super tiny value. Um, and then finally, yeah, the D goes Q. So this one is for the broadening of the delta. Um, and then this is for the broadening also of the delta, but in the case of uh, lambda or alpha square f. So this is the phonon broadening. In the case of phonon, the phonon frequency are usually, typically, I, 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 I would say, have uh, energy range that are much lower than the electronic one. And for that reason, usually the Gaussian broadening that you need to put needs to be much, much smaller. So a typical value for the d goes would be 10 mEV or something like that, or 1 mEV or 5 mEV, whereas a typical value for the Gaussian broadening on the lambda or the alpha square f, uh, it should be much lower because the difference of energy that you're dealing with is, is phonon's energy, so I'd say are much smaller. So typically you, you, you want to use uh, 0.05 mEV, so very, very low value, and then increase a bit. Uh, and this was also done yesterday, so you're, there was a range of broadening that by default is printed uh, by Quantum Express, but also EPW, and, and you can change that value if you want. So you have degos, and then you also have n degos, which is the number of uh, Gaussian smearing you want to do. It's exactly the same ID as what we did yesterday with Quantum Express. So, um, so the way to converge uh, uh, the calculation is usually to converge the coarse grid. So you want to increase a bit the coarse grid. So usually you don't need to increase it too much, but you want the phonon to be converged, for example. So if your Q point grid is too small, you, your phonon might not be converged. So you need to do a, a convergence on the, the coarse grid. And same for the um, K point grid. So usually the bottleneck with the K point grid is that the winerization is not good enough. So you might want to increase the coarse K point grid in order to get a better uh, winerized uh, value. So typically you, you don't want to increase those too much because the, the cost of the calculation increase quite a lot. So you want to have the minimum grid such that you are converged at the electronic band structure and the phonon band structure level. Uh, and then obviously you need to converge the fine grid. So there are different ways to input the fine grid. You can have homogeneous fine grid, you can have uh, random grids, you can have uh, user uh, selected grids. So file KF is basically uh, reading a, a file. So you put file KF equal uh, a file name. And this contains the points that you want to compute uh, the electron phonon matrix element on. Um, and so, you don't have to use a, a homogeneous grid. You could, you could input, for example, a, a Cauchy distributed grid that is um, with a, a denser sampling. So typically, if you want to do mobility, you actually want to have a very dense sampling close to the bottom of the conduction band minimum or, or valence band maximum. So something that you could do is, for example, the logarithmic screening. Uh, obviously, the, difficult, the difficulties, if you do that, is to correctly have the weight of the points. So there are different ways to do that. Uh, if you do, for example, a Cauchy uh, grid or whatever, you can always, for example, use uh, a Sobol to uh, compute the, the volume of each point, and the volume will be linked with the weight of the points that you need to put. Um, and of course, you have the, the traditional kind of uh, convergence parameter. So E cut is the E cut used in the SCF calculation, and obviously this should be converged. Uh, and finally, as I said, this is not really a convergence parameter, but you, you need to increase the F stick so that your uh, property do not change with the windows around the, the family level, depending on the property you want to study. Okay, 
so yeah, this is it. So you have some references. So if you have a question, we can, I mean, I'm happy to answer them now. Um, otherwise, we can go a bit earlier to the uh, dinner. And then this afternoon, uh, Carla will, will do the first hands-on and then uh, basically presenting how to, do, how to do a typical EPW calculation. And then uh, the second hands-on, I will do it on how to compute um, mobility uh, in semiconductor and uh, resistivity in uh, metals. Okay.